What happens when you add cryptocurrency to startup investing? You get science. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Mike Jones. He is the co-founder and CEO of Science. Welcome, Mike. Oh, thanks for having me. So what does Science Inc. do? So we're a venture studio slash incubator uh, located in Los Angeles, and we also have a venture fund. So what happens is we meet with young uh, and startup uh, entrepreneurs. We identify areas that we want to focus in on. They typically come in and work with us, and we help them develop their business. And then as it scales, our venture fund will kick in and fund them. So we're both an incubator and a venture fund uh, together. So what makes Science Inc. different than other incubators then? Well, it was founded by myself and three other par partners. We'd all um, built and sold businesses, some successful and some unsuccessful. And we felt that entrepreneurs really needed structure. They needed um, a strong group of advisors and mentors and kind of a shadow operational team that could help them grow. So we founded Science as a way for to kind of foster this or original or early stage growth and innovation within these, uh, within these startups. Um, so we get involved in the companies. Um, our involvement can be for the entire length of the company. So it could be for five years, it could be for seven years. Um, we kind of work as a shadow management team. So we sit with the CEO at least once a week. We work with them on strategy, on growth, marketing, hiring. We help them with fundraises. And then our fund also participates. So we're kind of a lifelong partner for early stage founders as they're developing their, their business. How did you originally get involved with cryptocurrency and how do you utilize it in your incubator? So uh, I had come across Bitcoin maybe five or six years ago and just as a technologist that loves to build stuff, just thought it was the coolest thing you know, I had seen. Um, and, uh, and then about late 2016, um, we kind of saw the market come back because if you remember like Bitcoin you know, grew up and then hit like $1,000 a coin and then it crashed and then it kind of felt like we went through this kind of two year pause where it felt like the whole concept of cryptocurrency wasn't gonna happen. Um, in late 2016, it started coming back. Um, we got really excited about Ethereum and the platform that Ethereum was building that essentially allowed kind of anyone to build their own token. Um, by February or March, um, I think we, uh, of 2017, we all started seeing these ICOs come together, which is almost like um, a way of either pre-selling access to your network or maybe an alternative way of fundraising, et cetera. Um, we ended up structuring our own ICO to do it as, a, as an actual fund. Um, and so we did a, one of the first security tokens that's actually like a regulated security to kind of create a fund. And with those proceeds, we fund a team here and we fund startups that are building uh, interesting things in the blockchain. So similar to our equity startups where we incubate commerce companies or mobile apps and marketplaces, et cetera, we have another incubator that's dedicated to companies building you know, on the blockchain with some level of decentralized technology. Um, and sometimes they also then press their own tokens. So what kind of problems are you trying to solve exactly? Well, so, it, you know, in the, in the concept of decentralization, there's a few markets that we think are really special. So uh, three of the ones that I can, you know, consistently go back to are basically medical records, uh, credit scores, and messaging. And the reason why those three are important is, um, you know, right now, my medical record is in essence kind of owned and controlled by whatever doctor or hospital I visit. My credit score is owned and controlled by maybe Experian. And my messages are kind of owned and housed by, and maybe in my case, Google, right, uh, through Gmail. Um, these are three areas of highly personal data. And I would argue three areas where it would benefit us as just digital citizens if those corporations didn't control this, uh, this, this IP of ours, this component of ourselves that are represented online. So one of the neat ideas behind decentralization is that there could be thousands or millions of computers that could be part of this network they could secure this data, like they could secure my credit record. I could grant permission when someone needs good access to it or write to it. Um, I could understand who is accessing it. I could maybe even withdraw access if I needed to, but that data wouldn't be controlled by a singular company. And so um, I love this idea of distributed computing when it relates to creating private and personal ways of controlling my data. And off of that theme and a few other themes we've seen, um, you know, we started looking at ways that decentralization can kind of benefit the everyday user. And we, we work with different companies trying to achieve that. How do you safeguard privacy when everything is distributed? Well, so, you know, in these distributed systems, there's a, there's a you know, uh, there's, an, there's an algorithmic argument that they're actually much more secure than centralized systems. 
Um, I think the easiest way to think about it right now is, do you feel secure with your current centralized system? So although I don't feel often that, you know, my Gmail is at risk, um, I do feel like my credit data sitting inside Experian isn't a great idea right now. Um, Experian's been hacked multiple times. That's very personal data to me. I'm not sure I really like it there. Um, I think that also my my email and my messaging data, not only is it inside of Gmail, but it's in tons of inboxes that are all over the globe and on so many different devices. Um, and then with medical records, I'm not even sure if my data is secure. I don't feel like I even control it or have access to it. So in those three pools, I would argue that I'm not currently sitting in a methodology that's either controlled or that I feel is secure. Through decentralization um, and using, in this case, maybe Ethereum or one of these blockchain solutions, you're moving it to a way where I have more control. Um, the risk point maybe sits more in myself, um, but at least I feel like the data is more secure than it is inside these centralized organizations. Um, and I generally think this is a movement we're going to see with a lot of personal data where you're actually moving them into kind of like a, a network setup where you control it versus the company or the provider you're working with. Um, and if we architect these solutions right, they should be more secure than the current you know, methods we're all using. What startups make good investments at the present? So, I, you know, I've been doing startup investing for a long time, um, both as a personal angel for the last, gosh, it could be, you know, 15 years, and then also as a custodian of other people's capital through a venture fund. At the end of the day, um, it all comes down to founders. You know, if we find great founders and they have great visions um, and they have strong ability to attract talent and attract capital around them, we can build great businesses. Sometimes we're able to incubate the the dollar shave clubs or the dog vacays that go off and become really great companies. Um, you know, you know, even if you and I collectively identify some really cool market and some idea that's going to work in that market, if we don't have great founders, it really just doesn't really matter. So first and foremost, the best startups are the one that have, you know, great founders with great vision. Um, the second piece is depending on the size of the vision, it may or may not require a lot of capital. And so we have to take into account, is there really capital there for these ideas? Like, is it the right time? Is the market really going to sustain it? Is it in a location that can attract a lot of capital? And then the third question is, if we have a great founder and we do have capital to grow, is there value at the end? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, people give venture capitalists like myself capital to put into the market, but also to obviously drive returns. So I have to make sure that there's going to be buyers in the market where I can find liquidity for whatever value we create. So I look for great founders that can attract a lot of capital for their vision or the right amount of capital for the vision in markets where there's naturally going to be exits or the ability to kind of sell my stock in those companies. And that would be a good, you know, startup investment and that would return uh, hopefully good proceeds back to my, my investors. You mentioned Dollar Shave Club and, you know, Michael Dubin's company back then was a really interesting kind of startup. How has investing changed and evolved since that time? Well, you know, he was approaching disruptive commerce um, in this thesis that we really believed in. And the thesis was that large brands didn't really know their customer base. So if you're a large brand, you really know your target rep or your Walmart rep, but you don't really know the people that are actually purchasing your product every day. Um, and we believe there was this movement to kind of this loyalty component where brands would actually understand who their customers were and they could obviously adjust their products or their messaging based on those customers. You know, Mike had um, what started as a simple vision, which was like really connecting with you over this frequent need, which is shaving. But then this kind of broad, this broad relationship he wanted to build with you where they suddenly have all these other products. And he's really creating a one-stop shop to solve your, you know, your grooming needs. Um, and, and I think even, frankly, could go even beyond that. Um, he executed really well. You know, back then, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs look at his path and like, oh my gosh, like such an incredible journey, four years, you know, rumored at a billion dollar exit with Unilever. But the reality is like every point was difficult. You know, I mean, the market was hard, the fundraising was hard, and I'm sure he'd be the first to tell you that just like with every startup, it's a difficult journey. One thing that's changed is I think that, um, that a lot of, you know, investors now understand that these direct-to-consumer brands that can build these uh, highly loyal relationships will be really valuable. So... I think unlike the time when we were working with him, um, the market's much more favorable and there's more capital available for companies like his. And just as we see um, in recent acquisitions, there's more and more acquisitions of companies that look like him at similar sizes as his. So it's a pretty interesting market to spend time in. I think it takes a very particular type of entrepreneur going after a very specific segment of the market, but it's a, it's a positive climate to build things like that. Okay, Mike, how much of a role did that really creative video help in marketing the Dollar Shave Club product? It helped a lot. Um, you know, I think, 
you know, Mike's like obviously an awesome creative individual and he was able to put that together even before we even met with him. Um, so that he's, you know, obviously he's super talented. But one thing it did is if you, if you think about the brands that you decide that you personally want to buy or any consumer buys, there's a number of touch points that that brand has to have with you before you make that purchase, right? So if you see that really cool new product through Facebook, then you might also do it through Instagram, then you might also hear a friend about it. And maybe it takes three touch points before you decide to make that first purchase, you know, into this brand. Um, you know, what that gave him obviously was, you know, that first really strong touch point through people's exposure to the video to a lot of people, right? So, you know, if normally a, a fresh brand new company has to spend, uh, you know, for three marketing impressions on a customer to get them to decide to purchase, he kind of got the first for free, right? Because he had this like incredible viral moment. A lot of brands aren't that lucky. They have to pay for all three. So it gave him a really big leg up. It also just set the theme of the business, right? Which is, it was this brand that was kind of an every man's, and every woman's brand. It was easy to connect to. It was humorous. It was self-reflective. It wasn't intimidating. It felt to be like you're being part of something special. You kind of had a secret relationship. You were part of a club. Like he hit a, a lot of themes that would have been hard to do through just a traditional static ad on Instagram. So that initial connection he made, um, you know, was both obviously highly favorable to him from a cost perspective, but also like really built loyalty. So what's the long-term goal for Science Inc. or Science ICO? Well, the Science ICO is, is um, you know, it's very similar to a fund. And so similar to a fund, we look to put that capital in the companies and help develop companies that can return a lot of value back to our token holders. And that's exactly how it's set up. So what happens is if, um, you know, if we make an investment into a company or we help launch a company and as part of that investment or part of that launch, we receive some level of proceeds, tokens, cash, whatever it is, we actually use uh, a smart contract system to distribute those proceeds uh, out to our uh, token holders. So, you know, what normally happens as a fund is you make an individual investment or you make a whole series of investments. And when capital starts coming in, you then deploy it out to all your investors. Um, we, in essence, do that through the token, which is really cool. So the moment if I go buy tokens in a company that I'm excited about or I incubate a company that grants us tokens, um, I can execute the smart contract provision that sends all the tokens we receive from an investment out to all of our science token holders immediately. So unlike a venture fund where you have to kind of wait and typically the individual investors don't get to control the shares they see, um, in, our, in our token, uh, individuals actually get immediate proceeds off what we do, which is really cool. So the goal is to put that capital to work, find great you know, entrepreneurs, build great businesses, and return those proceeds back to science token holders the same way it is through a venture fund. It just has a little bit of a different market that we're going into versus our traditional kind of equity, equity startups. I think a lot of us are wondering what kind of conditions might create the next crypto bubble? Like, like maybe it was a bubble and now it's not a bubble and maybe it could be a bubble again kind of thing. Is that? <laughs> well, you know, I think that's a legitimate way to position it. Yeah. I mean, I think we're all a little concerned that this is just going to blow up. Yeah, or it's already blown up. I mean, it's it's hard it's hard to know. Um, I think that you know there is this moment. You know, th there is obviously this crazy consumer moment last uh, you know September, October, November when the markets were almost up to uh, what like eight hundred million dollars or eight hundred billion dollars, seven hundred billion dollars, like a massive market cap. And I think that was um, that was obviously fueled through a ton of speculation, a ton of projects launching mass media talking about it and general normal uh, investors buying in or trading or purchasing these tokens. Um, and that fueled this crazy moment, right? Then I think you had this, uh, you know, this 2018 moment right now where people are like, is it a security? Is it legal? How do we structure these things? Is the government favorable? Is it safe? Like there's all these big questions. I think, you know, from, a, from, from, from the product person in me that believes in consumer products, like I think, um, what's really exciting is when normal people in the world are using some great piece of technology, they feel their data or their transaction are secured inside this technological, technological framework, and they don't even know it's on the blockchain. It just, they know it's a secure way to do something and millions and millions of people do it. Right. Um, I think that's a really exciting moment. I think the moment we can get mass adoption for a consumer level product like that, I think that you'll see that, uh, the market will change again. That's not to say that the old projects that raised a bunch of money may or may not be successful. It just says it opens up room for a new project to really go off and become something special. 
Now, some of this also could be fueled through, you know, large companies adopting it, which we're already seeing. We're also hearing rumors of, you know, Facebook or other networks really exploring what it means to kind of have a token and use a token, whether it's for currency or for data or for privacy. So I think you'll also see some really big companies adopt it that'll probably fuel another wave of, of speculation. But right now, my focus is find great companies that are doing big consumer ideas and make them really simple for people to use. And let's get millions and millions of people to use them. And if we do that, I think we'll just build a great company. The fact that it's on the blockchain has the token is almost a secondary thought. You've already held many leadership roles throughout your career, whether it's as an investor, board member, or CEO. In fact, you were the CEO of MySpace um, several years back. What, what was the biggest takeaway as a learning experience, as a, as a leader, that maybe you would do differently in either that role or one of your other roles? So, yeah, when I, when I came into MySpace, um, you know, I had previously done really small startups, and then uh, I went into private equity, and I had run some medium-sized companies, and then I had this opportunity to step into this giant company that had thousands and thousands of employees a global operation, and obviously an immense amount of public pressure because um, Facebook was on the rise, and clearly users were finding adoption within the Facebook platform and not finding what they wanted inside MySpace, right? Um, and so there were so many amazing, you know, lessons that I pulled out of that journey, um, but some of the things that really stuck with me, one is like sometimes mass adoption of a technology requires stair steps, and you have to remember that when, you know, when MySpace was born, um, it really was still, you know, highly, people were highly skeptical of giving their real name online. Um, so the, the idea of a true social graph that represented your real friends was something that's really foreign to people. We're still at a point then when people are nervous about putting their credit cards into web pages, right? Um, so the you know, one lesson is that sometimes, you know, the first company to break through that wall isn't going to be the one that really wins. So I think MySpace trained the world that uh, a social product that connects people with daily content is really special. But it's even better if it's based on your real names and your real friends and your true network. Um, and MySpace wasn't going to be able to change because one of the other second pieces of the learning is that it's really hard to change the DNA of a company. So if your DNA is an anonymity and your internet friends and things that you like and bands you connect to, but not really your real friends, it's really hard to make that change. And so these early stage company DNA, um, how they program their business and how they build their culture around it is super important because it lasts for a very, very long time. So I walked away from MySpace feeling like it wasn't that, you know, my, MySpace was never prepared to fight the Facebook battle because MySpace's DNA was just fundamentally a different DNA. Um, you know, probably the, you know, the smartest thing that News Corp did and we helped with was basically determining that we weren't going to win that battle and that our time and money would be better spent doing other things. And so we came to the conclusion that no matter how much money we wanted to pour you know, into that social battle, it wasn't something that was really gonna warrant to win. And so we broke MySpace into pieces and sold it off so that News Corp didn't have to think about it. And it wasn't something that was always gonna be trying to be positioned against Facebook, which is a hard lesson to learn, uh, both as a founder, a CEO, uh, or in, in News, case, is News Corp's case, an owner. Um, but it's super important to understand when you need to cut your losses and pursue other strategies. That's great advice. So what would your advice be for a young entrepreneur who's, who's potentially considering their first startup? Well, I think that there's a lot of lore on how you, you know, how you discover uh, what you're going to do and, and, and what you focus on as an entrepreneur. One thing that I find is wrong is sometimes you can be told to just completely pursue your passions but some people's passions make really lousy businesses. And so it's, uh, it's important to basically understand that like, just because you think something's incredible or you see some opportunities perfect, if the market's not really with you and you can't find a lot of other, other people that really support that, it may not necessarily be a great business. It might be a great hobby. And so you have to not only be you know, stubborn from the perspective of uh, you have some vision and you really want to execute that vision and you're willing to kind of put your all into this vision, but you also have to be open to understanding where the market is and how your customers feel about things. And if there are customers for what you're going after, and if you find um, that there aren't, maybe you should spend your time somewhere else. And a lot of entrepreneurs somehow believe that like this, that there's this distinct stubbornness that's kind of rewarded with success off of people just pursuing in light of, you know, adversity. But the reality is that I don't think that that happens very much. Um, I think what happens is that you have stubborn people that often pursue, and then after a long period of time, they realize that maybe the market wasn't there for them. 
you know, or that the result wasn't as big as they anticipated. And you have really smart entrepreneurs that understand that maybe their exact um, you know, view into the problem isn't exactly right. Maybe there's a bigger problem. They need a lot of feedback to kind of find their strategic approach. Well, that's great advice. Again, Mike, I appreciate your time. And if somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out uh, more about Science Inc., uh, maybe in your investment opportunities, how can they do that? So we have a, we, we have a fairly up-to-date you know, website at science-inc.com. Um, and I'm readily available on Twitter at M Jones, M J O N E S. Um, and I took the respond to tweets and direct messages. So they can reach out to me anytime. Well, I'll certainly do that. And thanks again. And if you guys want to find me and more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic, or maybe find me on social media. If you go to my website, which is tanyahall.net, I have links to all my social sites. In fact, if you want to chat, I hope you'll find me on Twitter. I'm at at Tanya Hall Radio on Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.